Firstly, Anna, thank you so much for doing this session. Now, I think our listeners should know that when we started planning this podcast, that is the Race Base podcast, we thought of interviewing top tier athletes like yourself. And your name, Anna, was in the top three list of athletes. But at that point of time, we were a bit nervous and we did not want to get right into it because you're an absolute beast. So we took our time to build a confidence and refine our approach. Now that we have you here, it is an absolute honor to have you on a podcast. So thank you so much, brother, for doing this session. I wanted to check, you know, how does it feel to know that you are among the top three athletes that we wanted to interview and kind of inspired us to start this podcasting journey as well? Oh, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm really humbled to be here. Uh, I, I can't call myself a beast. If you like to call me a beast, that's that's a fantastic thing to know. Um, I like, uh, like, like, I mean, I say this every time. I do this for me more than anything else. So, I, but and I keep pushing myself. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm inspiring, and I'm glad that I'm on your top three. That feels freaking awesome. Uh, super happy. <laughs> That's absolutely great to know. Now, before we start, Al, I just wanted to check. You know, how is your day going on so far? Listen, it's Friday. It's almost end of the day. Super excited. It's gonna be a busy weekend. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it feels good. It feels good. Happy, yeah. Yeah. There are things happening this weekend. That's great. Um, and how is your week yeah. going on? A week, week is good, man. We've been, I mean, at the office, we've been very busy. Uh, it's been a hectic week. Now, Ramadan is, is here, so like working hours are best, but uh, we are, we have a few projects that we want to finish. And like, I'm, I've never had such a busy schedule in my life. <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to accomplish so many things at the same time and train and spend time with the family and go pick up the kids and yeah, life, you know, it's good. <laughs> and I definitely have a few questions regarding, you know, what you do at for work as well, because what you're doing is something really unique. Now, before we get into that, Allah, can you tell our listeners a bit about yourself? And am I right in saying that you've been in UAE for well over two decades? Uh, you can say three decades. Yeah, oh, okay. More. So I'm an old fart. Let's put it this way. <laughs> With, okay, so listen, born in 83 in Syria. I'm originally from Syria. Um, uh, we stayed there for two years. The family then left and uh, we came to the UAE in 1988. So ever since now it's 2024 and so it's more than more than 30 years. So yeah, yeah I've, I've seen it grow from nothing to whatever it is right now, which is great. That's absolutely fantastic. And look, Allah, you're an absolute beast, particularly when it comes to fitness. And you have, if not one of the best Instagram videos. And what I'll do is, you know, on the show notes, I'll go ahead and mention your Instagram IDs and stuff, because I'm pretty much sure listeners would love to watch what you're doing in the Instagram space. Now let's talk about your fitness journey. Let's start with obstacle course race. And then I'd like to talk about hybrid fitness. Now, to our listeners, can you tell us about your journey in obstacle course race? How has your journey been so far? Well, so far, um, I've okay. So I started with with. Uh, so first of all, I, I used to break dance. That's what it is. So back when I was a teenager, my base was break dancing. So I used to compete. Me and my brothers were like the top. We, we have six boys, by the way, in the family. So the okay. uh, oldest three. We used to break dance together in the house, break things, break our bones, <laughs> and on the head, and, and do all this stuff. Uh, we used to compete as well, and we were uh, quite known in, in uh, back in the days. Uh, we've won a few competitions. Uh, there's a video on YouTube that I posted. It's all called Akawi Brothers or Akawi OBB team or something. I can give you a link. It's, it's, it's very bad quality, by the way, because, you know, back in the days, the phones, the Nokia phones did not have the HD camera that true, you yeah, right true. on this phone. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so yeah, because I've always been into sports, I've been into this fitness thingy. Then later on, I became bodybuilding. Uh, I would say OCR started only in 2015. Um, it's when Spartan Race came to Dubai for the first time. I think it was a Jawal Ali course. And we didn't know what that is. Um, uh, my brother told me, listen, there is this race. 
it's it's let's let's go for it. It's like running with obstacles. I wasn't a runner even. Like I when I used to run three k in half an hour, I'm so happy. <laughs> you know? And then uh, so we did. We finished that. It was I think a sprint that we did, and we finished it in like an hour twenty minutes, and we felt we've accomplished something great. <laughs> and 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 when, I remember like the feeling like. Uh, we thought the desert was an obstacle by itself. We're like, what do you mean obstacle race? The desert itself is an obstacle. But yeah, I mean, from there, listen, uh, we've been doing we've been doing lots of OCRs. So back to your question is just, my journey started 2015, but today I'm doing a lot less OCR than I used to before. At the last OCR event uh, was, I think during Ramadan two years ago, it was a Spartan night. Um, and there is a reason why I stopped, but we can talk about this later if you want. Absolutely, we'll definitely want to dwell into that. Now, regarding break dancing, I very specifically remember, I think it was in Spartan Alain race, if I'm not mistaken, where they had guys uh, playing some music. It was the African team they were playing, and you were doing some break dancing over there, right? Uh, dude, <laughs> she just put, she put some music and I start popping, like, ooh, come <laughs> on, break it, break it, let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah now, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> yeah, one question what I wanted to ask regarding the first ever Spartan race, obstacle course race in the Middle East, that was in Jebel Ali. How did you find out about it? And what was the initial reaction before doing that particular event? Listen, it was a talk of the town. It was always like, uh, there's this new race. Everyone is talking about like, there's this big thing that is Spartan. It's 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 like where you get these warriors and stuff. So so we didn't know what to expect. Um, no training whatsoever, you know. Like, uh, so we just went there. The experience was okay. There are obviously like everybody that does an OCR race. That there there are three levels of the experience before the race. Anxiety, excitement, is mixed feelings during the race. Thinking, why on earth am I doing this? And then after the race, when is the next race? I want to do it again. Very so, true. So, so I've I've lived that during the first race, and I wanted to do another one later on. And I remember, I think that one, there was another one after it in Abu Dhabi. Sadly, I couldn't go. My brother went, and it was the super. It was 10k, and I remember telling him, "Are you insane? You want to run 10k?" I couldn't finish 5k. You want to go double it? And he finished it, obviously. And then it got me thinking, I was like, I can do it. If he can do it, then anybody can. And you know what? I can very confidently state that so far as obstacle course race is concerned, you are kind of like an obstacle specialist as well. Because you know, the things how you, the way how you should do the obstacle, it is definitely at a different level. I wanted to ask Carla. What has been your overall experience in the world of obstacle course race? Tell us about the good, the bad, and the ugly side of obstacle course racing. Um, so, I would say, listen, the good is always, it was, it was a nice community. The people made it super exciting for us to go and enjoy these races. So, uh, and, and, and the opportunities to travel and, and enjoy these races in different locations was just fantastic. It was a nice switch from reality. Uh, the bad, there's, I wouldn't say the bad. Uh, I mean, there wasn't something bad about the races. Sometimes you would, I mean, it's just, it, all, it comes down to personal choices and personal uh, taste of, of where is the race location uh, uh timing that's that's just all personal stuff like it's just preferences um but i could say the ugly is 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 the standards of the race and the judging standards and and uh, you know i mean if i talk about myself whatever i do in life i do it to the rule so i follow the rules and i like to be i don't like cheating i don't like cut corners so while other people go in and just want to enjoy themselves and i understand that that's all cool but then when i used to go in obstacle races and and go for in the open categories I'm, i don't mind if anybody wants to have fun cut corners whatever i mean you're here to enjoy yourself but the minute you want to go put that red band and you want to compete you better stick by the rules 
Exactly, yeah. The win, win fair and square. And I started seeing in obstacle races, especially in the in the Spartan races, that you know people are lenient. Uh, you put a blind side to the rules, and like yeah, yeah. like uh, you see people don't do the spear and they keep running, and it's like come on, I I mean I missed the spear, I'm gonna I better do thirty burpees, or like yeah, I mean so so small things, and and that's when I mentioned in the last race, uh, which is in Ramadan. That was for me like okay, enough is enough. I, I'm, I'm honestly trying to follow every rule in the book, and I see people just skipping uh, obstacles, and then they stand on the podium. They're super happy. Ah, eh, I won! Oh no, you just cheated yourself. Sure. So that's that's why I stopped doing Spartan races or obstacle races. What, what but, you it said. Been, but, it, but it has been a very fun journey, to be honest. Like it, I, I would say it changed my fitness beliefs or the fitness journey fitness mindset altogether it's, it's really good well what you're saying is absolutely spot on and a lot of the elite athletes they definitely echo exactly what you're saying and what i've noticed is that a lot of them who are very serious and do it with integrity they have switched on to other areas so what you're saying is you know something which race directors and event organizers should definitely take it on board now Allah, i've seen your different obstacle course race events I've seen you even at Tough Mudder, even at Ice Warrior Challenge, and even at Desert Warrior Challenge. Is there a specific event that spans that stands out to you, and is it something memorable for you? See, we always okay. We always thought that Desert Warrior, if I'm being honest, was the most fun. Yes. Um, and when I say fun, because the obstacles in it, uh, they change. They're not the same. And. Like I remember one of those races I had we had to swim and we had to just go under I don't know like it was, it was insane um while in in Spartan races there there are standards and it depends on the category where you okay do we have the Hercules hoist or we have the uh, you know Atlas stone whatever we have but we know what they have and in desert warrior it was it was different uh so I used to enjoy desert warrior up until last race we've done where i was doing the monkey bars and then the bars fell while i, while I, while I was doing them and I, I was like come on guys this is what's happening the obstacles are becoming a hurdle all of a sudden so that was uh i think the last one but they never made anything after it yeah uh i swear here listen it's i swear is is interesting i would recommend it to anybody to do it once but then it's either you like it or you don't. I, I did not fancy the ice experience much. It was too slippery for my liking. I think if you need to do it, you need to invest in proper gear for it and footwear mainly. Because I've seen people get hurt really bad when they slip and they break their back and all. So it's it's not, not really for everybody, but uh, it's, it's a fun race. It was really enjoyable. I really enjoyed it when I did it. I've done it only once. I didn't want to do it again. Um, Tough Mother, I tried it once, and it's not for me. Because Tough Mother, uh, I'm, I'm mainly in solo races. Tough Mother is more about, you know, group. Yeah. So, uh, and luckily when I did the Tough Mother, I, I used to always go to Spartan races or like any obstacle races with my brother, my older brother. Um, we, we, we don't see each other throughout the year. We only meet during Spartan, like obstacle <laughs> races. <laughs> So luckily we were together and then, you know, there were obstacles where we, it's impossible for you to do alone. So you have to have the help of someone else. So I didn't really understand uh, how c you could be competitive in these races. So I just, I was like, done it, tried it, not for me. And did I miss anything else? So that's, those are the three other races. Spartan, yeah, the main ones, yeah. Yeah, the Spartan races, they're, 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 they are what they are and, and they're, they're nice. Now, I know the answer to the next one, but if you had to pick, let's say, between Desert Warrior Challenge, Tough Mudder, and Spartan Race or Ice Warrior Challenge, which one would you pick if you have to do it for one last time? I would pick a Spartan, even though I think you might think that I was going to say Desert Warrior, but I would pick a Spartan Race. Oh, that's really interesting. Now, Ala, let's travel back in time. And I think our listeners should definitely listen to this part. There is something called as Project 1959, an IG oh, yes. post that you mentioned on 18th of December 2020. Can you tell our listeners what it is, what gave you the motiv motivation, and what was the journey and the outcome? 
Okay, so I have this crazy friend. Her name is uh, Ghada. Uh, and Ghada, when you see this, yes, it's because of you I did this race, this freaking project. <laughs> so uh, the idea is you run a 5K under 20 minutes, right? So that's why it's Project 1959. And back then I used to train with uh, George Crew. He was my running coach. And obviously, George excited, got excited. He's like, yeah, definitely, mate. This is for you. And and listen, back then, my 5K time was, my best 5K run was 23 minutes, 50-something seconds, right? So I, I need to shave off at least four minutes to beat that uh, sub-20 uh, target. And... And and yeah, from from that project was insane because because we had like three months and we need to achieve that or two months maybe we need to achieve no it's a three months and we need to achieve that goal. I gotta be honest, it was tough, but it's doable. Trained so hard for that, like we had uh, lots of easy runs uh, where you run at uh, math pace. Uh, math pace being, uh, you know, at, uh, like maximum aerobic uh, functionality, uh, which is your 180 minus your age. That's the heart rate where you need to run. And then you need to run for like longer this time and, and at least 40 minutes. Then you have to have your tempo runs and you have to have your track sessions. Now, tempo run is if you... It's not techni technically your, your track speed because your track, track sessions are shorter and they're faster. But how long can you hold uh, as, as, at less, I mean, a, a, a lesser pace than your tempo, than your track on, on a tempo run for, how, for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you repeat it two, three times. Um, according to George, it was always, let's build the engine. And if you have the engine, then speed will come a lot easier. And uh, after three months, we went for a time trial, and I failed. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I failed it. But I was I got twenty minutes, nine, uh, 19 seconds. So that nineteen seconds, I would say twenty seconds, because you need to you need to be under twenty minutes, was just killing me. I remember we ran with another coach from Inner Fight. He was the pacer, and uh, he was pacing the group. We were all we were like five of us or something. Uh, and then, just towards the last kilometer, I, I just I, 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 I ran out of gas, and I couldn't keep up with the guys. Uh, probably because I went up, uh, went too hot at the beginning, and uh, I thought hey, I could do this. But then there, there's something you learn every day. But then we trained for another two months, and I went back again on, on the sketcher uh, race in, down in Medan. And guess what? I did it in 20 minutes, two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know how that kills you from the inside? It's like, come on, come on, three seconds. Yeah. And then I remember uh, the last time I tried, it was in after summer break. And it wasn't planned. It was a regular track session. George George Crew tells me, listen, we're going to do a 5K trial. You have Flo as your pacer. It was me, George, George uh, B, and, and uh, George Blackwell, and, and uh, Flo. And the day before it, I had trained my legs, heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, and my legs were sore as... I'm not going to say a bad words, but I, <laughs> so does that. Okay. And then, yeah, and we went for it. I, I did not think about anything else other than, hey, focus on the goal, follow flow. And I was running on the outside. I remember we were on the track, and then I'm running on the outside, and there were people running. So every time I would like take the outskirt and just you know, try to come back in. And I hit that 5K before them. And when I hit it, I looked at the watch. I was like, hey, I made it. We're still in the 19 minutes. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. And yeah, that day I, I, I did the 5K of 
in 19 minutes, 19 minutes, 19 seconds, 19 minutes, 19 seconds, something like that. So by 40 crazy. seconds, you smashed it. That is a brilliant achievement, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then, so it doesn't end here. As a result of that, three months later, I tried the 10K tri time trial. And then again, in the 10K, I beat my, I, I, I crushed the 5K under 20 minutes as well. So I remember it was 19 minutes, 30 something when I hit the 5K mark. Okay. And then, and then I finished the 10K in 39 minutes, 19 seconds as well. So that that's was a great achievement too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was insane. <laughs> And that is definitely shows, you know, what resilience is all about. And the way how I'm looking at your Instagram post is, you know, whenever there's a failure, not only are you just accepting it, you're working on it and building on it and keeping that in mind, Allah, what advice or message do you have for people who have similar target and they fall short? Listen, um, I think everybody out there should really believe in themselves. I think, and, and people should stop listening to what other people are saying. And it's not about other people. I just, I used to always compare myself to others and, and something that I keep doing, but sometimes I do it because I want to push myself as a target. So when I look at other people, I'm like, okay, I need to target this person so I can beat them or be better at certain things than them. So that's, that's, that's how it works. The problem is people start to compete, uh, compare themselves to hire more athletes that are like way above their level and then they look at it as a mission impossible yeah but then that's 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 a problem and i think people need to just set out short-term targets that are achievable and every time you achieve that target then you look at okay so what's the next level so if you're running a 5k in like 40 minutes don't go out there and say, I want to join the 1959 club. You know, yeah. It's not going to work. You're setting yourself to failure before you even do anything. What you need to say is, I need to hit that 2959 club. Because from 40 to half an hour, yes, let's talk about that. And let's take it step by step. And I think what people you know, are afraid of is the pain and 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 they don't want to go through this because we as human you know like we're always in our comfort zone anything goes beyond the comfort zone is uncomfortable and we don't like it so True. we get a taste of it we feel the pain now you're in that zone we're like what are you gonna do are you gonna develop yourself further or are you gonna go back to complaining mode it, it's the ball is in your court and I think people just really, it's a small percentage of people that, that see the light at the end of the tunnel and endure the pain. I mean, listen, I just told you about the 10K race. In that 10K race, I remember uh, the pain that I felt in my glutes and my thighs at the third kilometer was unbearable. And I was talking to myself and I'm thinking, this is just pain that's going to finish in another half an hour. What is half an hour? Listen, half an hour of pain is a lot of time. But what you try to say to your brain, the body listens to. So when you tell your brain, this is just temporary pain, then that pain becomes numb. So after me passing the six kilometer, I'm starting to look at the bright side. Hey, I finished 60%. And I've endured whatever I had to endure. And I think everybody out there should look at it this way. Always, see, listen, everybody works differently. There is a, I work in a way where I, it's either the, you know, people look at it as either the cup is half full or half empty. How do you want to see it? And, and, and I look at it always like, okay, listen, I'm finished this much. I still have this bit to finish. Then the brain accepts that, all right, we're almost there. Yeah. Stack it up and just go. And I apply this everywhere. It's not just my fitness life, you know, it's just even in my business, even in my uh, communications with my daughters and how I tell them, how I teach them. It's just all about that. It's just mindset, mindset, mindset. And I, I can't say I learned it the easy way. I learned it the hard way.
Yeah, and what I'm really liking is, you know, as you mentioned, it can be applicable in our work life, business life. And I play drums and I try to incorporate, you know, what you're saying in playing music drums as well. So absolutely spot on. Now, regarding obstacle course race, I'll have one question. Is there a message you'd like to share with race directors or event organizers who arrange OCR events? Um, listen, if if we're talking obstacle race specific, I think they need to revamp something. If now Spartan races have been out for some time, and uh, if today I'm going to say, hey, look, there's a Spartan race, I don't think it's going to excite anybody. Uh, because, unless there's some tweak to it. Now, it again, it differs from one person to another. Some people really love uh, OCR. For me, now I'm into hybrid. And there is a reason why I'm into hybrid, which I think we're going to talk about later. Yeah. Um, but I think for Spartan races, like, Outside the UAE, they introduced the Spartan Games, for example. And the Spartan Games were exciting. I'm watching the show and I'm like, why can't they do this here? I like to be part of it. It's not just running. There are other elements to it. And the brand itself was, was I mean, the brand Spartan, I still like it. There's something behind the brand that makes you feel the, the grind, makes you feel like you're, you're tough. It, it toughens you up, really. Uh, unlike Tough Mother, or like Tough Mother was fun. Uh, yeah. uh, Desert Warrior is fun. Spartan was different. So I think if they're coming back, well, one, they need to put their judges right. <laughs> all, yeah. all the volunteers need to know. Um, you can't have people, uh, <laughs> I remember one of those events, I was doing the monkey bars, and there's a, there's a technique that's called the chicken hook or something. So what, if you're tired, you can go up and hook yourself, like put the bar on, 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 on your uh, elbow. On the elbow and then rest while you relax the rest and go. I remember one of those judges saying, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong, down, down, go down, 30 burpees. I was like, what are you talking about? 30 burpees, it's monkey bars. I was like, dude, just go read your handbook. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? Jeez. I ignored them. I continued my, my, my uh, monkey bars and I just, it's like, he doesn't know, it's fine. Um, so like, it would be small things like that, like get things right. Maybe it's about location as well. I mean, one of the, my, my most memorable Spartan races was Hatta. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the fact that you're in the mountains and you're seeing beautiful things. It's, it's just beautiful. And I think that's what I liked most about Spartan races or like or obstacle races, just taking me out to locations where I would never normally think of going to. So it's like, fitness tourism at the same time what's better there than, 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 than that right absolutely correct yeah now Allah, before we move on to hybrid fitness let me read out a post that you shared via instagram and i want you to elaborate this to our listeners as well so you posted the thing something fairly recently and what it actually said that it actually had a question that some people ask you why do you do this and you had a section answer where you actually typed not for trainer, not for income. You do it for you, for your mental and physical resilience. You do it for your beautiful family. So you are strong and when you are 80s, you're really fit and active, fueled with entrepreneurial spirit, driven by excitement, and you love pushing your limit. And that is what makes you feel better. So why don't you elaborate this to our listeners? Because I think when I read it, I think it was absolutely beautiful, to be honest. Listen, um, I... I... <laughs> okay, funny story. So I'll give you, and many people ask me, why do I do this, right? And many people say, why do you torture yourself? I'm like, why are you looking at it as I'm torturing myself? And, and some people get motivated. So there are two, two sides to the story. There are people even outside from this region. So there are people that follow me in, in North America, some people that follow me from South America, some people that don't even speak English, man. Um, there are people from Brazil, from uh, the States, and, and from Europe, it, Italians, uh, some, some from Asia as well. And a lot of these people send me messages uh, saying, please continue doing what you're doing. You inspire us. 
seeing you going out there and doing whatever you do, it's just like, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And you still have a life. You have two beautiful daughters. You're just like, it's just amazing. And then you get the other side as well. The people look at you like, enough with your sports already. You know, like, okay, I understand. You run 10K, like it's a piece of cake for you, you know, whatever. But at first, like, I'm, if I need to do this for other people, I won't be doing anything. And that's what I mean. Like, I'm not doing it. One, I'm not a personal trainer. People thought I'm a personal trainer. When they say you're a person, no, 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 no. Let me tell you. I have, right now, I have Andy. Uh, he was my personal trainer. He's from InnoFight. He's fantastic. Shout out to Andy. Uh, I had George Crew before as my uh, personal trainer. Shout out to George Crew. He's fantastic. Uh, and before that, my very first trainer was, his name is Dan. He left to South uh, Africa. He's, shout out. You're the first one that came up to me and said, let's do a personal training. But before that, uh, uh i didn't have any person i was just doing it out of my head anyway back to the story which is i'm not a person trained so i'm not doing this to earn a living and my instagram page is not there so i can you know get sponsors and and promote products i mean if that happens <laughs> great hey whatever uh but it's not my goal uh my goal is to share a journey of how can someone start from i mean Nothing, really. I used to just lift weights, look at the mirror, take selfless uh, selfies, you know, and like <laughs> shout when I deadlift, like, ah, whatever, like try to make a noise. And no, I don't do that. Now it's all about let's do things right. Let's let's have the right form. Let's do it for fitness. Let's do it. For, when I say I just do it for my family, it's very important because one, you inspire your your family. People see your kids see you. And now my kids say, okay, Baba, you're going for running? So she knows I have to do this. And she goes, Baba, uh, Mama also would exercise? Yes, Mommy will exercise, and she does exercise. So you build that mentality that exercise is part of your daily life. It's not something, I mean, listen, if, if we lived 2,000 years ago where there is no... Uh, desks and computers would probably be farmers and we do this for a living so there's no need for an exercise because you're doing physical activities every day but today in today's life you're sitting on your ass all the time <laughs> so you better be moving um so yeah it's and and, and a funny story when i was in in if, if you, you just you said something about my uh, instagram so there's one post that i posted in my trip in italy two years ago. It was mainly me carrying the kids all the time. The one is on top of my head. The other one, I'm carrying the, the stroller and I'm going upstairs and downstairs. I'm not complaining, but that's how I spent my vacation, you know? But then that's because I'm, I'm fit enough to do it. So, and I'm fit enough that we can go places uh, and it doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. Nothing could stop us. So, so you live a good life if you have a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and affects your mindset. So your mindset of that resilience, if I go back to that race, the 10K race, that mindset of like thinking the cup is either half full or half empty, up to you, but you're gonna reach that goal no matter what. And that's the same thing for business. I mean, business at some points, I, I do run my own business, right? And some points, I mean, right now we're doing so good, thank God. Uh, but there are, times a few years ago where you know with COVID hit for example yeah. you know COVID had to shake the tree and then there are a few yeah. leaves left on the tree and you're thinking oh damn what do i do so sure. you either go into panic mode or you're like let's find solutions you know like there's your your mind stops stops thinking of i'm losing you're just looking at the bright side of things and everybody out there can do this. Who said, you know, you, it's not, let me, let me rephrase. So the, the brain is really, really a tricky part of the human body. And it's really could control you to go either forward or pushes you backwards. And yeah. how you position things that's that's how it could be dangerous for you or could be inspiring for you and others so i 
I do this for me because I don't need to be listening to the comments that come in. I, <laughs> I had a client who, if he watches this, he's going to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I love him to death. Who said, I was at the gym and I was working out. I finished my workout. I was super happy about myself. I opened Instagram and I looked at your story that says, I said, I did 140 wall balls and I felt like shit. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I was like, I was looking for that unfollow button. I want to unfollow you, man. <laughs> so I was like, dude, why are you looking at it this way? <laughs> You've done your part, which is perfect. You've done the workout. So that's that's good. And that, I, so I take you back to the point of if you run a 40 minute 5K, don't go and say, I want to run 20 minutes. Just take it one step at a time. Let's achieve 35, then for 30, 25. You can reach a 20, trust me. It just takes time. I'm not Superman, dude. You know, like, <laughs> I still have a lot of learnings to do. I, I'm trying my best to compete with the top guys. And it just happens with the continuous training. Yeah. And what I'm really liking is, you know, like you're comparing it to business, which makes perfect sense. And what the understanding, what I'm getting is when you're facing problem, not only are you going to find solution, knowing what you're talking about, I think you're looking at it as an opportunity and you're using it in the positive direction, you know. So thank you so much for sharing that information. Now, Allah, let's talk about hybrid fitness. How would you describe hybrid fitness to our listeners? It's fantastic. It's the best thing that's ever done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. So hybrid fitness, so hybrid fitness for me is, is a combination of running, which I honestly don't really like much. I mean, I appear like I enjoy running. People think I enjoy running, but it's, I, I, it's part of my fitness journey, so I do it, and I have to master it. If something you don't like, you do more of, so you like it, or you're forced to like it. True. Um, but in, in, in hybrid fitness, it combines strength training, which I really missed when I was doing the Spartan races. When you're working for an obstacle race, how many times are you going to do the obstacle? Once. Yeah. So if you have a wall you need to climb, it's just one wall. So you really need to be able to jump that wall once and that's it done. In hybrid fitness, in the different competitions, you have to do many repetitions in that specific station and yeah. you have to be efficient at it and you have to be strong enough to perfect it and move on to the next station with the same level of efficiency and carry on that efficiency one station to another until you reach the final destination and, and achieve the goal that you have so it hybrid fitness brought me back to weightlifting not in a sense where i'm a bodybuilder because really i don't i'm nowadays i'm not like it, it made me change my mindset to I'm not working out to look good. I'm working out to feel good about myself. I'm working out to have a healthy lifestyle. I'm working out so I'm strong at functional matters rather than aesthetics. I, I don't want to look good. For, I, if people tell me, oh, you've got six packs. You don't have to worry about things. I was like, dude, it just comes part of the package. <laughs> you know, yeah. you eat healthy, you train well. That's it. I mean, it's just, it becomes a habit. You're building habits as you go. Um, and, and that's, that's hybrid fitness is, is, is really exciting. And, and I think you, you're, you're going to be asking me maybe about High Rocks and DECA and the other uh, events maybe. So yeah. I'll leave it up to you, but I hope I answered your question. Absolutely, Spot. And I wanted to ask you, how many High Rocks events you have done? Uh, so I've done... Uh, four so far and i just booked my fifth one and am i right in saying all that you've done high rocks internationally as well yes i have my very first uh, high rocks event was in amsterdam mm -hmm. um, my second was in london uh, third and fourth are in dubai or okay. were in dubai and then i i'm not gonna go to doha to do the fifth one if it wasn't Doha, I was going to book somewhere in maybe uh, Asia. I'm gonna, I wanted to try something in Asia other than Europe. 
-huh. But yeah, but now Doha is closer, so obviously it makes sense. I think last year they had it in Singapore as well, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. I was gonna actually consider Singapore this year uh, instead of Doha, but it's just almost around the same time. Same and and I, yeah, when I try to book my Hyrox races, I like to give at least four, three, four months window because yeah. you need to train enough to advance. If you're going for experience and just want to have fun, then sure, you can go the next month, the next week, doesn't matter. But you're not going to see significant change unless you have, allow yourself some time to learn, understand what went right and what went wrong, and then work on those uh, weaknesses to make them strengths. And how do these international events compare so far as the quality of athletes are competing? Tough one. Listen, it's it's I had different experiences in three different countries. Obviously, the first one was because it's the first one, I was super amazed. Like I remember walking into the Amsterdam uh, venue and I was just wild. I was like, I was I remember I was tired, I was sort of sleepy. The minute I walked in, the vibe just like whoo. I felt the energy, I felt the fire, yeah. and I was so excited, I was like, yo, man, let's go! <laughs> and then the level of athletes, I honestly, it was my first time running next to a 60-year-old or something, and I've never seen this before. And they're running so efficiently, and, and I'm looking at them I'm like, this guy is fast, and he's all white hair and i've never seen this anywhere else i was so inspired just looking at those old people competing in these events it's like hey it's normal let me just go for high rocks sure. uh, while over here you don't see that you don't see that you know um there are few older athletes that we always see them and they always podium because they have nobody else to compete against in their <laughs> age group. Age group, yeah. yeah I mean, no, no, no offense, uh, but I'm just saying this is the reality of the situation. Over there, no man, it's, it's different. Different. So, so I think the mindset of people over there is is completely different than the mindset over here. So the the level of how they take fitness, I th I felt there is much more respect to the sport than here. Not saying that people over here don't respect the sports, uh, but it's just like the de determination over there, they're so determined. In London, London was great, but I didn't have a nice racing experience because it was such a busy event. And because it was overpacked, I, I you know, like in, in Hyrax, they give you a fast lane for faster runners and they give a slow rain for slain for the slower uh, runners everyone was on the fast lane so you have to run on the outer lane and when you do that and it's so busy you're running more distance which is okay but then it's it's really the traffic is so annoying and people push you and they're running between columns and you can't really pick up the pace so it's, it's that makes you also say that also like listen the quality of the Dubai and the race that we had in Dubai was sometimes better. So I would say Hyros is trying to keep it consistent. So there is a consistency in the races, which I feel, be it in weights, in 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 the, the sleds, they're trying to unify everything, which is which is really great about this particular event or particular race in general um so yeah that's it i, I hope i answered your question sometimes i talk even more and i, I get drifted away from the topic no you definitely did now regarding high rocks dubai you smashed the podium what was the feeling like so it's great to have this here in my office behind me <laughs> uh i kept it here if you want to ask me because there was uh, I have enough medals of Spartan at home, and uh, uh, there was a point where I was going to throw them all in the garbage. Um, not that I don't like them, but just like, okay, you know, it's your house, and you have more important things to be on the wall than just medals. 
So instead of my wife putting this away, I thought, hey, let's put it in the office. <laughs> it's, cool, it's, a cool, it's a cool background. People, it's, a, it's a conversation starter sometimes when you talk to clients. Like, what is this? Ha, ah, let me talk to you about uh, High Rocks. <laughs> let me <Yeah>. inspire you. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was, the feeling was great, honestly. Like I went in with a target to beat my time, uh, my previous time. I went in just to beat at the, each station. I had a target for that. My target was not the podium. My target was, and that's the beauty thing about, like a beautiful thing about when you podium and your mind wasn't set for that because if it was set that I need to podium and I didn't podium, it's going to leave me really upset. But when you walk in thinking, hey, it's me against me and I need to better myself. I'm doing it for me. That's all you need to do. And then, hey, it was a nice surprise at the end when I was just like, I checked the, my time and I was like, hey, third. My coach was there. I was like, hey, Andy, don't go anywhere. I'm third. I was like, oh, no way. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was, that was great. Now, what I wanted to ask is a very specific thing. During the running event or during the zones, was there a specific moment or specific zone in the race you felt like things were going as planned, how you intended to be? On the Dubai event? Yeah, the one where you smashed the body yeah. Okay, so... The good thing about all Hyrux events is that you get a split of every station. So you can really compare apples to apples, unlike any Spartan races or Desert Warrior or anything, because, you know, it really depends on the, on the, you could do a 5K in half an hour in, in Abu Dhabi, but a 5K could be 40 minutes in Ras al Khaim, for example, because it depends on the venue and the location. Yeah. But in High Rocks, it's always the same. These, these German brilliant guys, they, they calculate it in a way where it's like systematic. So I remember when I was during the race, I knew exactly like when I leave the sleds, if I let, left at X time, I know I'm ahead of my previous time by few minutes. If I finish the burpee zone at X time, I know I'm ahead of, you know, myself okay. uh, in that manner. So I remember when I finished the last, uh, the seventh station, which was the lunges, I looked at my watch and I was like, hey, I could really beat my previous time very well. So that was, yeah, it's, it's, it, that's the indication. You just, you look at your time and you know, and, and when I, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's really how it works. And at the High Rocks event in Dubai, Allah, was there any added motivation because the event was held in Dubai? Uh, yes, of course. There was some added motivation. See, ever since I started my fitness journey, ever since I went to all these obstacle races and all, I used to go with my friends that I used to compete against. It's not the same as having someone going there to support you. And in, in Spartan races, you know, you start at the start line and then you vanish away, come back after a few hours. <laughs> but in High Rocks, it's one centered station place where people can see you. So for the first time since, I don't know, I started my fitness journey back in, I would say, I mean, taking it seriously was in, 2019, 2018, the first time my family decided we're going to come and support you. Uh, and not only that, so also my wife came, my two daughters, beautiful daughters. Uh, my daughter did a nice poster that said, you can do it, our super dad. It was so beautiful, so beautiful. My friends came along. And I remember one of my uh, friends, Osama, shout out to Osama. He said, uh, listen, today you're going to be top five. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Listen, I'm not going to think about that. It's like, I'm telling you today, top five. Sure. And my coach was there. So Andy was there as well. Shout out to Andy again. And he was there. And I remember with everybody shouting in every station if 
if I say this correctly, you know, like you isolate everyone and you just listen to that one voice. So okay. during every station, I was just listening to his voice when he was saying few comments. Everyone is shouting, you can do it, push, yeah, one more. And in the back of your head, you're thinking, this is just blah, blah, blah noise. I'm happy you're here. But what I'm looking for is you're resting too long. Three, two, one, go. And you go. I'm looking for pull back with your hands and back. And and so and, and your hands. Use your hands and your back. Step as you step back, use your arms. You're not using your arms. Okay, I'm probably doing something wrong. When you do the burpees, get up. Just breathe, deep breath, go again. So a few things, even with the wall balls. Oh man, the wall balls. Because when you reach the wall balls, that's when at the end of the race, that's when your mind is just like you're destroyed. And you have a game plan and, and you try to go by the game plan, but every time that game plan goes to south, that like goes south. And um, I remember I heard two voices, my family and friends shouting, don't stop, go, you can do it, you can do it. And it was just, that was just noise fading away, I'm listening to it. And I listened to someone else saying, five, four, three, two, pick up the ball. You pick it up and you go, and you go. And when you break, the minute the ball hits, you hear five, four, you know, you're just thinking, hey, I've got five seconds of rest, that's it. Yeah. I've got someone that I'm, I'm, I need to be accountable for this person. You know, he's made the time, and my family as well, and my friends, they made the time and the effort to come and watch me. I better suck it up and just go. So does it make a difference? Yes, it does. In Doha, I'm going to be all alone. But I'm going to be remembering these things because I need to be accountable for all the people that believe in me and they believe I can do this. So, yeah, it doesn't make a difference. It makes a difference. What you're saying is absolutely inspirational and it is definitely giving me chills. Now, I'm not sure all of you watch UFC or mixed martial arts. You know, there's this very specific moment where Leon Edwards, he was losing pretty much 99% of the moment. And his coach at that point of time started saying, you know, you need to pull it out from the fire, son. And rather than what was happening was that, you know, he is keeping his shoulders down. All he did, don't keep your shoulders down. And just that moment triggered it. And he had, if not one of the most iconic chaos probably in human history, you know. So definitely what you're saying is spot see, on. I've, I've, see, I've done boxing for some time. Uh -huh. yeah. And I remember also, uh, I had a friend of mine who was a boxer. And he was, I was sparring with someone and he was in my corner and same thing. All I can hear is only his voice. Everyone is shouting, but I hear him saying, hands up. So you need to cover your face. And then when you start getting tired, it's like, cover your face, left, left. And then you need to go like, pop, 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 and then cover, you know? Yeah. So, and you hear it. And then when he says uppercut without you thinking, pop, pop. And I remember when I did that uppercut, the other dude was on the floor. Yeah, I can't see it, but I'm listening. I'm just obeying. So that that you know, having a coach by your side or having someone that tells you exactly what you need to do, is is an additional eye, that additional input that you really need and actually helps you. Yes, it's the same thing at at work and everywhere else. You know, like uh, it's never a solo journey, man. Everybody that tells you, ah, it's a solo journey, no. Now you call a solo yeah. journey. It's either you do it together as a unit or you're out 100 percent agree and there's this iconic scene in this movie called us warriors where tom hardy you know he's trying to listen to some voice and you know he wants it to be his brother but then he realizes he's actually fighting with his brother so, you know what he said is definitely really really ins inspirational as well now what i want to ask is Allah, do you think the uae could have world champions in deca or high rocks or any other hybrid events who are dominant champions um, I think Deca was almost gonna 
like it was if, if Dekas remained and continued I think it would have had the chance to have a world uh, event over here I could I could have see, I could see that happening um I'm I'm not sure about Hyrox because I, I honestly don't know the organizers uh, behind it well and I don't know how they think so it's it's a new sport and um so far it's always been in Europe yeah so so I'm, I'm honestly I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that question um but do I see it happening in the future I think so I mean considering how Spartan world champs happened in Abu Dhabi for a couple of years so I don't see why not other events could happen here I mean the sport council in Dubai or in Abu Dhabi would welcome such an idea and I think actually the Dubai Sports Council was from the rumors I hear <laughs> uh, is that they were super surprised of the uh, outcome the people that attended uh, the Hyrox event it was unheard of yeah. um, and the second event was super busy as well like people loved it uh, so yeah I, it could happen I think the second event it had more than 6,000 people attending it right yeah and you never know the rumors could be true because I wouldn't be surprised if the High Rocks World Championship does actually take place in Dubai. That would be absolutely iconic. And now, uh, Ala, you're constantly training, training at an extremely high level. What I wanted to find out is when you're, let's say, competing for an event versus when you're regular training, is there something that you do differently? <laughs> Uh, there is nothing called regular training. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. So, uh, um, okay, so here is how it goes, especially for me. And I think other people should do the same thing. I think if you just work out for no specific reason or no specific goal, then you're just training. Yeah. And if you have a goal in mind, then your training makes sense. And then the volume of training or the type of training will translate to that goal. Um, and that goal could be anything. I mean, my goals, I try to book events that I train for. So um, be it a high rocks event, be it uh, now tomorrow we have a race as well, uh, the primal event, or be it uh, a, a, a run that you want to, you know, break your personal best. So these targets should be the goals that you work towards. Um, some people just want to look good, but looking good by itself is not only a target specific target but say i want to look good um by losing x amount of kgs and building maybe this amount of muscle mass so i can change my waist from a 36 uh, you know to 34 for example and i need to achieve it in four months uh, i need to have that beach body uh, be it for females or for males you know what i mean whatever that is uh, and then it comes with not just training, because training is 20% of the formula. You still have to eat well, yes. you know, uh, and you have to sleep, and you have to hydrate, and you have to do other things. Um, and I, th so that goes back to me when I train. I would say the volume of training is what differs. It's not just regular training between in compared to uh competing training it's just the volume as i get closer to the event i will increase my volume but then sometimes you reach a level of fatigue where your body is tired so yeah. you need to deload a little bit and then go back again up and very often uh, i would push so hard and then i re i reach that fatigue level way faster than i expected and the body you start seeing signs it's like uh, automatically you start going to the gym and, and then like you can't really lift or push or or you know as much as you're used to and you're thinking 
what's wrong with me? What happened? I used to do this easily. That's an indicator of, okay, probably you're pushing too too hard. And so, sometimes just people really depend on these watches and, and these technical data. I think it's there as, as, yeah, it could help. But if you're stuck on numbers, yeah, I mean, who cares if the watch says, um, your training volume is low. No, 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 listen, watch. I was deadlifting more than I used to deadlift usually, but you're picking up my heart rate. Now, my heart rate is, is super fit. So my heart rate doesn't go as high as you want it to because I'm just lifting uh, five reps or six reps or maybe three reps. So it's the watch is not satisfied, but my body is satisfied. So that's that's what I mean with it. Like the volume really changes. And then when you hit that uh, fatigue, so I usually deload. And then before the event, if I did not feel that I've reached uh, the peak of my training, where I, like for example, let's take sled push, for example, in a, in a high rocks. So now I'm trying the pro level. So the last high rocks I, I competed in was the pro level. And in the pro level, it's different than the open, where the weights are much heavier. Uh, you need to be comfortable pushing these weights and then running and pushing the weights. And in my, in my last uh, race, I, I was, even though I was really training hard for it, it was my first time experiencing it. And I realized, wait, there's a lot more to learn. So leading, leading to that uh, race, I realized in our training, in the sled push, I wasn't pushing hard enough heavy weights. So the weight is 175 uh, kg of plates plus the uh, the sled itself, which is about 30, 25 kg. So it's in total, let's, let's say it's 200 kgs, right? So I used to train a lot with 150, 160, 175, 180 max. And then I, re I was talking to my coach. I was like, listen, dude, we need to reach the 200. I need to push more, so I, when I go to event day, I'm feeling this is easier. And yeah, so so that's 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 when you know you push really hard before the event if you realize you haven't trained enough. But now we're training hard from beginning. <laughs> so now I'm trying to we're trying trying a different formula where we're pushing really hard now, even though the race is in May. But let's see if I don't fatigue sooner. Yeah, and what you're saying, it does make a lot of sense regarding body getting fatigued. And I did have an interview with Ryan Atkins, the greatest of all times of us obstacle course race is concerned, and he mentioned something about OTS, that is overtraining training syndrome. That, you know a lot of them i need to identify in order to make peak performance now what i wanted to ask is Allah, how do you identify when you're reaching peak performance are there a couple of matrix that you tend to look at listen the body gives you signals all the time yeah. there are signs that you feel all the time and sometimes we overlook it sometimes we think ah it's all right it's just a you know pain in the in the, in the calf it's all right it will go away you need to listen to your body. And the older you get, the more you need to listen to your body. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I'm in my 40s now. So, uh, you know, I can't just go to the gym and lift heavy immediately. My warm up uh, process takes a, lot, a long time until I reach that heavy weight that I need to lift. Um, so, and I remember. A month and a half ago, I was uh, during a track session. I was running, running, running fast, and I felt that slight pain in my calf. And I was like, man up. It's all right. Go for it. I wish I didn't. I wish I stopped. Because that led to a tear in my, in my, in my muscle. Okay. And that, when I tore my muscle, it, that led to me stop running for another two weeks for it to heal. So, yeah, the body gets fatigued and you get the signals and you just need to listen. And regarding High Rocks event that is coming up, how is your preparation going on? And you're definitely participating in it, right? Yeah, the one in Doha, yes. I mentioned I booked my uh, ticket again for the Pro Division. Um, there are specific stations that I'm trying to really 
develop my fitness at and, and become better at. So how am I going about it? I'm going heavy. So I'm going heavier than expected, heavier than race day for everything. I'm still a bit slow. Like, for example, if we take sled push or sled pull or whatever, and then you realize hurdles as you go. Like sometimes when you're pushing really heavy on the sled, it's like, okay, all of a sudden your footwear matters. It's like, okay, you're, you're, you're starting to slip. So I need to maybe change my shoe. Uh, sled pull as well. Sometimes like, you know, <laughs> two days ago, I was just not going anywhere. I, I just need to use my arms because my legs are slipping. Um, the wall balls, how can I get better at wall balls? Like every week I'm doing 150 wall balls, for example, in one session. So go heavy, 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 push, push more. Get used to that pain. Get used to that feeling of, you know, it hurts, but it's all right. And then understand how much rest you need. So every time you calculate, that's just, when I say you, need, you go in, like, remember I mentioned I go in with a game plan for the wall balls, but then that game plan doesn't work because you're, it depends how you tackle the wall balls in your training. Sometimes you tackle it from, okay, I was resting, and now let me do 100 wall balls. Yeah, okay, sure, you can do that. I could do maybe 40 at one go, and then rest for a few seconds, and then go for another 20, and the rest. Yeah, but because you started at heart rate that is, you know, comfortable. But what race day, you're already in that orange zone. You're already, yeah. like, at threshold. So you reach there, your heart is and it's just, there's not enough energy even in your body so you can't start and do 40 so let's be realistic what can you do 25 stop at 25 and then how much rest you need so this is what we're trying to do now I'm trying to understand um and try to get the right formula for for each station now all i'm going to put you on the spot what would be your prediction time for high rocks in qatar uh okay i <sighs> <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but but I would like to, I would like to be, so uh, see, listen, when I did the pro division, the, the four pro race in Dubai the first time, I was, I went in with the mindset of, let's go in, let's have fun, enjoy myself, and let me see what I can do. I finished the race with the same time that I've managed in the open, my in my first high rocks. So I was super happy because if I man at the, at the beginning, I started and uh, this is the level where I was at with the open weights and then I matched it with the pro weights. That means my next stage would be, what did I do? What, how did I better myself in the open? Let me better myself in, in the pro at the same level. If I can shave off like three minutes and yeah. be at the same level of that uh, open level, then that's, that's all I need. And I'll be happy about it. And then the, the race after it, you say, let's shave off another two to three minutes and see. I mean, I'm trying to be realistic. If I say I want to shave off six minutes, I'm just lying to myself, you know? And and, it's, and I'll be disappointed at the end of the day. And it's not about it. So it's just like maybe you need to, again, work on how can I keep myself motivated? Like yeah. I said, so you're doing it for yourself. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, I'll have you smash the podium once again. Now, all what, uh, I, I can use another <laughs> flag somewhere here. <laughs> <laughs> now, all of, in your fitness journey, be it obstacle course race, ultra running, or hybrid events, can you take us to a dark moment where things didn't go as per planned? And how did you overcome it? Uh, so, there is one DECA event. Um, it was. I think Deca fit, and I don't know what happened. Usually, things like training for the event was going so well, right? And I mean, Deca fit is only five hundred meters run between every station, so it's it's fairly easy, like two minutes run, that's it done. Um. But then I remember I started, I was with a bunch of friends competing against each other that we train with all the time. And I had my chest strap on. 
and I remember that was the last time I put my chest up when racing. I've decided this is it, that's the end. Because when I finished the first run, we did the first station. Then the second run, I felt something is tight on my chest and I can't breathe. And I didn't know what it is because I always train with my chest up. And I didn't change the tightness. And I remember after the third station, I was like, there's something wrong. Something, someone is like choking me from my chest and I can't, I can't push anymore. So I started walking and I remember George Crew was, uh, I was still training with George then and he saw me and he was, he looked at me, he's like, he told me later on, he's like, I was thinking, fuck, this guy really hurt himself bad. And I, I just didn't know what to do. And I walked, walked, walked a little bit. And then I told uh, the organizer, I can't do this. And he's just like, listen, do the next station. See how you feel. And let's talk after. So I just removed that strap, uh, chest strap, heart rate strap, threw it out. And I kept trying. I was like, screw the data. Who cares about the data? Just go by the flow. And I went in, enjoyed myself, and I continued. I remember that. I remember that day. Like that was, I, I went in with high expectations for that race because I was really well fit for that race. And uh, it's just so that's when technology works against you. Like yeah. you're thinking you need all the data in the world to understand, and really you don't. So now, um, when I do the Hyrox events, you know you do it indoors, so this watch doesn't pick up your pace. It's, it says I'm running six minutes per, per kilometer. Well, I know I'm going a lot faster. Uh, but I I use a different uh, heart rate monitor, which I put on my arm. Um, uh, and I use it as an indicator only for can I push more or less? OK, yeah. So that's it. So I look at my watch. If I see orange color, <laughs> you know where that needle is pointing? Is it pointing to orange? It means I'm, I'm, I'm where I need to be. If I'm in the red, I can't sustain this for longer. If I'm in the green, push, Mr. Akawi, push, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, that was that was one of the moments. And I remember also, I think I mentioned to you running the 10K race, when I got that pain in my glutes and I was thinking, man, this, this really hurts. This really hurts. And it's just a matter of talking to yourself, thinking, get over it. Stop thinking about the pain look at other things look at the people around you look at the scenery look at the i don't know positiveness those are definitely interesting stories and you know the way you're handling it is definitely inspirational as well now Anna, you briefly talk about nutrition in your instagram post but listen we are both past 40s and i got to ask this to you personally as well how important is eight hours worth of sleep and are there any tips you'd like to give to our listeners and to myself as well regarding sleep I don't sleep eight hours. I wish I sleep eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> Try to have two kids and life, and uh, no, no, it doesn't work this way. Listen, about this eight hours, and I'm, 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 I'm not a believer of, you know, you need X amount of time to sleep. I, I think it's just you need to rest well. To recover well so you touched base on two points there's nutrition and there is sleep let me just talk about sleep then we'll go to nutrition if you don't mind so in sleep i i anything below six hours is a problem because i think like uh, below six hours it's not enough rest time for the body to recover and really your body really heals itself when you're sleeping you build muscle when you're sleeping and you need that um Sleeping more than seven hours, I think, is just pointless at this stage. Um, you're missing out on life. Yeah, <laughs> you're missing out on life. It's just, um, um, it's not just fitness. There are so many, you know, beautiful things you can do with your kids, with your wife, with your life. Uh, waking up early is such a blessing. You enjoy the day from the beginning. I mean, these. The people that like to wake up at 11 o'clock, I'm just thinking, dude, your day is gone. Exactly. You know, like, yeah. What are you, what are you doing? Like, and I, I sleep at three o'clock in, in, 
at night. Like, why would you sleep? What to sleep? Or this, you know, let's go back a few uh, thousand years back and whatever before the age of computers and everything. People never had these luxuries of like you know watching Netflix or, or likes of that. People slept normally, and and because of the lack of not lack because today actually we have all these devices. These devices give us a lot, like all of that screen time. It just messes with your brain. Yeah. So if if we I read a study where back in the days, you know, they used to sleep six hours. The farmers, uh, for example, sleep six hours, six and a half hours, seven hours at max. And that's, they feel so refreshed, energized, and they go back to the field and they keep working. And these guys, listen, they don't think about retirement. Retirement is something that we think about because we want to be lazy. You know, we want to sleep more, but hey, <laughs> We humans were not built for that. We were built to keep working. This engine shouldn't stop. And that's when I say, why do I train? I train so I can keep this engine going. It's it's my mission in life that I want to be 80 and I'm still competing on whatever in whatever competitions are out there, be it Hyrox, be it Spartan, be it whatever. I want people to see me and say, look at that 80-year-old man. If he can do it, I can do it. And I'll be like, yes, Mr. 15-year-old, you can do it. Because I am still doing it. You know what I mean? So so sleep is, yeah, it is important, but I, oversleeping is a problem. Today at my age, honestly, if, if I oversleep, I wake up with a headache. Oh. I'm like, why does my head hurt? <laughs> <laughs> because, listen, there is also a cycle of sleep, you know? And this is what people don't uh, understand. And, and when I say people, it's someone very close to me. Some, if she hears this, she's going to hate me for life. But yeah, <laughs> it's like there's a cycle to sleep. When you go into deep sleep you, and, and, and you wake up, you, you, your brain is awake now. So you force yourself again to go back into this level of deep sleep. You need to complete the cycle. If you break the cycle halfway, you wake up with a headache. And, and it's like, no, dude, you got up. You've got enough sleep. Your body is saying, wake up, get up. So if it's seven o'clock in the morning, that's your at the end of the cycle, that's it, done. Your body's fresh. You want to force it to go back, I need another half an hour. And then someone wakes you up, you go from you know, to the REM and, and deep sleep, and then I wake you up in deep sleep, you're going to wake up grumpy, you're tired. That's, that's just wrong. So yeah, I think uh, we... I sleep until I wake up. When I open my eyes, that's it. Get up. Yeah. Uh, and what you said is so beautiful because you mentioned about, you know, waking up early in the morning. Now, I'll have another podcast called Blockchain DXP where I interview CEO, CDO, founder. Some of them are multi-billionaires as well. One commonality which I found with them is every one of them wake up at four o'clock. And the very first thing they do is they go out for a run. They don't miss it even a single day. Another thing which I found out is that all of them are actively involved in some sports. It could be, let's say, boxing or watching UFC. Most of them, I follow them on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. They often post about sports-related things first, then they talk about business. So you know what you're saying is absolutely spot on and correct. Yeah. It's, it's a mindset. So you, so you need to train your mind first. And then when you build that mindset, yeah, everything follows. So, yeah, and you asked me also about nutrition. So, if yeah. you want me to answer about that now, uh, I think I posted once about nutrition. I don't really post much about food. I get asked a lot about what do I eat, and I openly answer. It's a very boring uh, subject because uh, I'm on a routine. I eat the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Like even. <laughs> At home, like for dinner, they ask me, "So, what is it today? Is it this or that?" You know, if, it's just they know. And if, if it's not lentil, if it's not uh, chickpeas, then it's lentil. It's chickpeas. And okay, let me order. I order <laughs> something. <laughs> I order a pasta or I order a salad or whatever. But listen, my food is is. Uh, I, I would eat solid food four to five times a day, and I get two protein shakes uh, as well. That's the only supplements I take. I don't take much supplements. I take sometimes some multivitamins, 
you know, that's about it. But food, I keep it simple. I, I eat five eggs almost every day. Um, not almost every day, actually every day. <laughs> and, and then like lunch will always be some, it has to be a, have a, have a mix between carbohydrates and, and chicken, well, lots of chicken, I eat lots of chicken. Yeah. Um, then the snacks will be, I eat, I eat dates, I eat uh, fruits and stuff. Dinner is like I mentioned, one of these options. Uh, but again, it's about building these habits. Like I, this, this food became a habit. It's a habit for me not to eat junk food. It's a habit for me not to eat processed food. Um, I look at it, they tell me like, you don't crave chocolate? It's like, no, I don't. Uh, do I want to eat chocolate? Yeah, sure. Sometimes when I have my coffee, uh, I don't mind like a, a bar. I would go to the supermarket, I'll buy like, I don't know, Galaxy or whatever it is. Actually, I'll, I like something with uh, walnut or whatever, or, uh, hazelnut. And if I get the big bar, then I eat a small bite and that's it. Like, uh, I call my kids, here you go. You want some chocolate? <laughs> you know? Uh, and it's not because it's, I don't look at it from it's healthy or unhealthy. I just look at it just, I built that mindset that, or habit that this is not gonna get benefit me much. It's just sugars. Do I need the sugar? Yeah, I do. And where do I have my sugar? I like sugar in my tea. Yeah. Yeah, I like, uh, there is sugar everywhere. There's sugar in bread sometimes. So I, I would buy bread that is tasty. Even, I don't know, it has sugar, I don't care, it's fine. I don't stop myself from eating now. So that's what I tell people. I was like, listen, I reached the level in my fitness journey where I don't worry about what I eat. So if you tell me today, let's go out eat Italian, let's go eat Italian. Do you want to share a pizza? Let's share a pizza. Uh, what are you having? I'll have a pizza and pasta. All right, let's go. You know, it's fine. Um, it's extra calories. Who cares? You want to have a burger? Sure, I'll have a burger. Uh, and, but when I have a burger, that's the thing is, like when you have greasy food, and the reason why I stopped it and I stopped alcohol altogether is just because the way it makes me feel the next day yeah. is what matters. If I tell me today, let's go have a burger, I'd be like, listen, do I have to train in the morning? If I do, there's no way I'm eating junk food. Yeah. Did I finish a hard workout today and tomorrow is my rest day? Tonight I'll eat a burger with you, not a problem, because tomorrow I'm not training. Let's, let's junk the hell out of it. Give me that Pepsi, give me that, you know, French fries. That's no problem. But I don't um, stop myself from eating this, uh, this food because also the body needs a shock. You need to shock your, your system. Like, hey, it's not just clean. Sometimes you need to get some rubbish in. <laughs> it's yeah. like, hey, there's a party happening over here. Yeah. Well, what's your thoughts about coffee, Alop? The reason I wanted to ask you about coffee is because in a fight, they have actually released a podcast, you know, discussing coffee and the impact on ultra running. Coffee as in, in general, yeah, I, listen, I started, I, I used to not drink coffee. I, okay. I never had coffee until four years ago. So four years ago, I started drinking coffee. Uh, it was funny that I was in a furniture store and my wife was just looking around and I saw someone from Nespresso. I had a nice conversation with him. He gave me the strongest coffee he had. <laughs> and from there, he gave me one after another and I kept on tasting it. And he told me why I need to drink water after it. And, and I was like, I like that feeling. Um, and then I started drinking coffee. Now, at the beginning, coffee used to give me a kick. Uh, so the caffeine in it gives you that boost that you need to, you know, like exercise and whatever. But at the same time, I don't know why coffee makes you want to go to the toilet, man. So it's like, it's a double-edged double sword. I don't yes. like it. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what do I think about coffee? Coffee is just like, honestly, like today, it's sometimes a conversation starter. So it's like more of... Uh, a social thing rather than I don't drink coffee for uh, hey I need I'm sleepy I'm gonna have a shot of coffee to wake up it's not gonna wake me up you know yeah. it's just like let's have a coffee because I want to chat to someone I'm gonna wake up let's you know let's make it social so that's that's a nice thing about coffee it brings people together <laughs> yeah true that is definitely a good take now Al I wanted to have a quick chat about Artology Creative 
that you're the founder and executive director, and I follow you on LinkedIn, and you posted via LinkedIn that you have revamped your website with videos and animation. So can you tell our listeners a bit more about Autology Creative? And it's a really interesting name, by the way. Oh, thanks. So Artology basically, uh, the name started came from Art Meeting Technology. Yeah, and we, this is a story not many people know about Artology, which is we started off back in 2013 as a company that sells animated art. So the story goes back where, uh, I mean, I, I used to work in TV stations all my life. I used to be in the creative department all my life. I studied animation and directing. So I have this uh, uh, love for telling stories through the mediums of video and animation. And I come from a family that they're artists. So we used to go to uh, art galleries and, and look at, uh, we have family, friends that are artists and all. So one of these days in 2013, I, uh, was looking at this one painting of a lady. She was sitting on a bench. She looked so upset. And there was a pigeon on her head. And I'm just thinking, I wish she could just, you know, wave her hand for that bird to fly away. She could smile and the bird will come back on her head and she'll be upset again. And that was it, boom. And I was like, let's create animated art. Yeah. I mean, listen, now in the age of AI, you listening to this story, you're thinking I can prompt something on AI and give me an animated painting. But back then, this was like unheard of. So uh, I remember I started my research and tried to find, because these paintings are like on big canvases. It's like, what can I do? How can I get that big screen that is not so expensive? And also back then, big, hey, you try back then, buy an 82-inch uh, screen. 82-inch screen, it's like at least 100,000 uh, dirhams. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if, yeah. if you walk into the house and see a big screen, like, damn, man, you're rich. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to think of all of those things. So I did my research. I spoke to... Uh, factories in China, try to get some screens over here. And I looked at a famous artist that I can animate their art. So I picked a family friend who was, uh, his name is Safwan Bahoun, a very famous Syrian artist. And we worked together on, on animating his art. Um, it was such a success, honestly. Everybody loved it. He loved it. His agent loved it. We went to Art to Buy and it was, we had three editions. It was sold out in like 45 minutes, honestly. So that was the birth of Artology. And so we wanted art and technology to meet together. But uh, I couldn't neglect my passion for creating commercials, uh, telling stories through the vid video or animation. So uh, we had two divisions in the company. And sadly, the art division just had to take a pause yeah. because of technology becoming cheap and becoming accessible for everybody. So it made no sense to sell art at, at whatever price tag we had, despite the artists that we work, worked with. But then um, but since then, we changed the formula of Artology. So now today, is Artology is a creative content creation studio. We help our clients tell, or we help actually not, not tell, we help our clients deliver their stories in the best way possible in the mediums of either video, uh, live action, or animation. So we cover, in, in, in terms of animation, we do 2D, 3D, motion graphics, you name it, and there's a lot of explainer videos, expa uh, corporate videos, uh, uh, how to is all done in animation and also in terms of live action we do tv commercials from high budgets uh, talking about thousands and thousands of dollars and then uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and you can talk about uh medium-sized projects uh, of, of commercials and corporate films and and promotional videos and all uh we are uh, so we've been in the business for 10 years and you mentioned the website so we keep on leveling leveling up our game 
we keep an, an, an eye on uh, technology and what's out there and all about it's all about now user experiences you get uh, I mean people my age are used to certain things but the new generation they look for different uh, websites different uh, user interfaces so you need to you know be ahead of the game you need to be present and you need to that's, that's 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 why we launched our new website and that's uh, that's what we do for artology and artology has been really 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 i mean i don't talk about it much on my instagram and and if i say the truth <laughs> i thought at the beginning when i started my instagram page is that i will use that medium to promote artology you know yes. so build that database and then uh let's uh, inject uh, my my page slowly with some work from artology so i can uh, let people uh, know about this but uh, I, I I do it sometimes. Uh, I now try not to mix uh, my personal life and and uh, my professional life. It's funny because sometimes when I talk to clients and they're like, "Hey, let's follow you," and they follow me on LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm in my like nice shirt. I look professional, and then like, but hey, there's someone that looks like you shirtless on on Instagram. <laughs> like, yeah, that's me. That's me as well. You can. I'm, Two sides of the story, <laughs> the yin and yang. <laughs> <laughs> now, now how important, you know, is a video and animated content in 2024 and beyond? Ah, man. You are having me as a guest on a video platform. Yeah. People can listen to this on Spotify, I'm sure. But also, I think people will like to watch this stuff. I watch podcasts. Sometimes I play or like, let's take podcasts as an example. I would play a podcast from YouTube while I'm driving. I don't have to see it. But yeah. I sometimes I like to see the reaction. I like to feel, I, I feel more connected than just listening to someone in my ears. So Instagram, look at Instagram. Instagram started as an image platform. And now all they're pushing is they want people to post reels. They want yes. video content. Facebook, same thing. So you realize the drive is always going through video. Posts are, or like static pictures will never die, but communicating stories through video has been increasingly wanted in the market people have more tendency to react to a video than they react to a static and not just any videos also there is a trick now so now you need to be up in the game where you know how to you deliver the message excite people and and get them hooked from the beginning like i'm sure now with the podcasts like not all podcasts are, are successful for maybe whatever like for different reasons but if you want to get a successful podcast you need to excite people from the beginning get tell them something exciting so they can you know get the hook and and we keep on educating ourselves to how can we tell the stories in the best way possible and how can we be efficient and ahead of our game so let's take ai for example now everybody's afraid of ai oh my god ai is there and it's going to change the world and yeah it is going to change the world to the better because yeah. all these tools are there to make our lives better. And it's, it's, see, 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 I'm trying to connect things. And I was talking about fitness and the mindset. And yeah, you can be afraid of, of AI and say, I'm going to lose my job. Or you can say, I'm going to master that craft. So our AI still needs me because AI yeah. does, can't run by itself. AI is just a functionality that either you run it or it gives you a standard prompt, a standard feature or a standard result or that anybody can get. So yeah. So is, is, is video telling very important? Yes, it is. We've been working with clients that actually want us to come up with a video concept that actually is the hero, is the mother, like you know, the umbrella, the big idea is coming from the video. And then that idea is implemented everywhere else. So their emailers, their their posts, their statics, their their, their their billboards, all follow that big idea that is a video first. So video first, everything follows.
and that's what we're trying to do and that's the formula where we're pushing it with so yeah it's it's it's, it's very important do i see it uh, dying no no hell no but do i see us going in the right direction i think we're going in the right direction yeah, you're absolutely spot on. And I do have a very specific question regarding AI and what your business is doing. But I just wanted to share that, you know, I tend to follow Facebook's actual financial summary. And in that financial summary, they have actually mentioned that the user engagement is increased by 80%. That is because of the Reels feature. And that is just going back to the last six months. So what you're saying is absolutely spot on. Now, regarding AI, you know, we briefly touched base upon. What I wanted to ask and get your opinion is, how can we still maintain the human element so far as artificial intelligence is concerned and keeping in mind, you know, autology, creative? What are your thoughts on that? The AI is, people are afraid that AI will replace jobs and will replace people. To a certain extent, yes. It could, and it will. But if you teach yourself to learn that AI is just a tool to help you advance in your career and build better content, because listen, AI, we use AI in our field for imagery and for uh, content, but there is AI in blockchain, right? There is AI everywhere. So, so AI is just very generic. AI actually was there since the beginning of time. It's like now only with sure. with the launch of uh, ChatGPT, people started getting afraid. Oh my God, AI is going to yeah. destroy everything. AI, AI, AI. People were uh, oblivious about AI, but AI existed. What do you think? Right? The CIA, the uh, <laughs> you know the police, yeah. Yeah. they all have AI. You know, it's just, yeah. it exists. But now that it's open to the public, people started to get afraid. And is it developing quickly? Yes, it is. Um, so what we do is just we try to learn the software. I'm calling it the software because it's it's a feature that we use to our advantage. Like last last year, we worked with uh, on a project for Dubai tourism. I can. It's it's called Dubai E Games uh, Festival. You can uh, see it on. Oh, yeah. Our, so that project, we had a very tight deadline to develop and to produce that project and, and it was if we had to go the traditional way we had to draw every frame and 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 it's like it's going to take us months to complete but we had three weeks to do everything and i mean listen people from outside our business they think three weeks might be too much but three weeks is actually nothing when you want to develop something of that riches so we studied ai and try to see, okay, how can we use AI in the best way possible? And how can we shoot something that once we feed it to AI, we get the results that we want? Obviously, there's a lot of try and error, but I think when we reached what we accomplished and then we showed the client, it was one of those few moments, you know, when you get uh, the, the, your office uh, rings and the doorbell rings, and then you open it and then you see a present and it says, thank you, Team Artology, for the hard work. That's that's what we got for that project because we understood the time frame, the sensitivity, and we used AI. And the client was super happy, even knowingly that we were using AI because everybody thought AI is a click of a button. But no, if you know how to use the tool, and if you know how to master the tool, then you become a pro. And that's what we try to do: is educate yourself, keep educating yourself, keep training. Absolutely spot on. And regarding AI, uh, regarding Artology Creative, is there a specific age group or category or sector of business that you're more catered towards that? Um, we're business to business uh, model. We're not okay. business to consumer model. So um, usually if it's a B2C, then, you know, the budgets are low and it's, it's, we're not that company. Um, I'm not saying it in an offensive way, but it's just like we have uh, a positioning in the market and that's where yeah. we're, we're working towards. Um, sorry, I, I forgot the question. Uh, the, no, which sector are you focusing on? Uh, so in terms of sectors? Do you want um, me to ask that question again? I'll continue it and I'll edit that part. Okay, okay. okay. And, and, and what sector all are you focusing your business towards? See, um, it's we we don't have a specific sector that we're focusing on right now, because our clients vary from uh, tourism. So we have lots of tourism. 
we do uh, food so and also under tourism we cover food assets uh, we work with sustainable companies that will look after the environment and all which is really an educational journey like working it's, i think one of the things i really love about our business is just the amount of proposals or like projects that we get that people want to explain to the public you start looking at projects thinking wow man there are some brilliant brains out there yeah and 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 getting to the exposure and the, the knowledge is beautiful so back to your sectors also we do sports um uh, and and lots of governmental work okay. so but but it's just we can categorize it differently like there are in in the video world so there are like the, the tv commercials which everybody goes out and does right to the, the commercials like in terms of production production companies which we don't like to call ourselves a production company we're a content creation state studio because sometimes we collaborate with production companies to we hire them to do the work for us um we're the creators that come up with a big idea and uh, coming up with a big idea for us is more important than actually producing the work ourselves uh, we can uh, we we're big believers of let's share the cake than having all of it it's, it's fine if we have a piece of the cake as long as we're getting more work and we're doing multiple of those um but so, so we try to do more of the corporate work if that's what i'm trying to say so corporate films corporate promotional videos corporate commercials um that's from the corporate side and from the fun side um the sports is fun uh, tourism is fun so so we have that but the beauty of that is just like we've got the mindsets that the, in the team so we have the creators that think corporately and we have the team that wants to have fun so you can speak to the animators they're like oh my god let's talk color let's talk imagine things flying and whatever and boom and that and avengers this and superman that and whatever it's like okay all right amazing and you get the corporate people that just always think of uh, okay what's the messaging that we're trying to say let's go back to the marketing objectives let's focus on on you know goals and they're very oriented which is which is good a good mix and, and i think the way we are operating now is it's more like a creative agency but in a smaller scale that is just focused on creating content and for our international audience who are into fitness if you want to check what work he does definitely check out all his instagram videos these are iconic two videos which stand out to me and which i've tried is one where you were doing burpees and the background keeps on changing I was like, how is he doing that? And the second one, Allah, you know, where I think it was with in a fight, you guys were at Wadi Shoka and they're going down the stairs. Oh yeah, so those two videos. <laughs> okay, uh, fun story. Um, so let's talk about Wadi Shoka first. So Wadi Shoka, uh, we were just a big group, and we went, uh, we ran up this uh, these stairs, stairs, right? Yeah. So once we reached up the stairs and. I was like, we have to do something cool, guys. Like we were all standing here together, and and you know, this is never gonna happen again. So uh, immediately I thought, stop motion. Let's do stop motion. I was like, come here, George. Stand. Tick. Take a picture. Go down a couple of steps. Tick. Couple of steps. Tick. Couple of steps. Tick. Okay, move. Rada, come here. Tick. 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 Flow. Come. Tick. 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 <laughs> and one by one, got all these guys. You know. And everyone is looking at me like, hey, we need to go back to Dubai. It's enough. I'm like, no, 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 no. You'll thank me later. It was it was a nice uh, project. Um, <laughs> it happened on the spot. You know, the best ideas sometimes are just uh, genuine True. ideas that just, you know, click. Uh, for the burpees, I was in the Maldives. And um, I enjoyed my run over there. And then all of a sudden, I thought, you know what? How can I show all these places to these people in a nice way and i thought that's it let's do burpees and it was funny because every time i'm running i stop in the middle of the road i put the phone i count my steps one two three Pawn in this way don't tilt too much and go back it's back backwards one two three now take a step to the side and now burpees pop, 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 pop. and people look at me it's like what is this guy doing <laughs> and then i'll run a couple of steps and i'll do it again and i'll do it again and I'll do it again and the editing was easy. It was on my phone at night. I mean, 
there's nothing much to do over there at night. And it, all right, done, let's go. <laughs> what I'll do is, you know, I'll definitely go ahead and put your Instagram ID in the show notes below. So pretty much your listeners would love to follow you on Instagram. Now I have two non-fitness questions. The first one is your favorite genre of music or any specific genre of music do you like? So it's it's funny you say this because because uh, music changes, man, as as you grow older. And uh, it's funny because two weeks ago I was having this conversation actually with our creative director here at Artology, where uh, he was. Uh, we play music in the office every day, so it's like we have speakers and everyone listens to music. Whatever you feel like, you go there, you put your playlist, and this is like it's a shared open space. If there is no music, we stand up like guys. What's wrong with you? Why are you upset? You know, yeah. let's play some music. Let's spice it up. So we play house music, we play chill out music, um, uh, we play some, I don't know, oh, the light is back on. Okay. We play some uh, oriental stuff. It's just like background music that is nice to have. Yeah. And I like to listen to this music even between me and myself. So there is that sort of music that you listen to while you're working, which is cool. But then, when I was a kid, and I told this our creative director, like, I'm sure you're a hip hop guy. And he's like, Yes, I am a hip hop guy. I was like, I relate because the way you're reacting to this music is just how I used to react to music when I was a kid. Because I used to, I used to make fun of my friends that used to like techno and, and trance and whatever. I'm like, Dude, this, how do you dance to the music? All you go is just like, uh, Yeah. While with hip hop, you need to like, you know, pa pa pa. You need to, you need to dance. You need to show me the move, man. Sure. Come on. Grew with it, you know, so, and that's where break dancing comes uh, comes uh, in play. So yeah, I I still like uh, I still like uh, hip hop. Uh, I don't fancy music beyond uh, the year two thousand. Anything after two thousand is just like whatever. Uh, it's too artificial, isn't it, and mechanical? Yeah, right? yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, but yeah, today I just listen more mostly to chill out music and and relaxing stuff. That's great to know. And is there a person you admire in life? There are a lot, a lot of people. Um, uh, there are family members that, uh, you know, they inspire me every time, uh, where what they have achieved in their life. Uh, my father is one of them. Uh, you know, is coming from a, from a graphic designer, reaching from, he started, my father started as a graphic designer and then reaching where he reached to be the CEO of one of the biggest publishing companies in, in UAE. He's retired now, uh, but see him reach that place, it means anybody can do anything. My Also my brother, my older brother that, uh, is now taking the company after my father. I mean, uh, not because it was given to him, no, he's actually got it as he deserved it and he bought the company. And yeah, he comes out of no educational, like high educational background and he made it. Uh, so those people really inspire me to say anything is possible. Uh, in the fitness world, it's a lot of people and I can't mention names because really, there are specific people that inspire me in specific aspects of, of the sports. And yeah, I mean, there are, David Goggins is one of them. Oh, definitely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to carry the boat? Exactly, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much for that. And finally, Ra'ala, as we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience, whether it is about your journey or upcoming race or any events that you're excited about? I mean, we have, uh, tomorrow we have the primary race. I'm doing it with three, uh, with a group of three. It's, it's one of the toughest race, races, honestly. Like, uh, yeah. high rocks is tough, but high rocks, you know, you need to work at 80%, 85% to maintain that pace. But when you're working with partners, you know, you have to work at 120% every time you go. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just like all out, all out, all out, all out, all out, and it hurts, and it hurts. We've done it before and we were number four and still we are uh, in the ranked number four in uh, their global ranking. So yeah, that's that's gonna be fun. For the audience, what do I wanna say? I mean, listen, um, 
thank you for watching this if you reach this far in the podcast this is amazing i don't know i think we've been going for more than an hour uh i salute you i hope you enjoyed this <laughs> and i thank you dearly for this uh, i would say listen reach out to me if you need any advice uh, I'm, i'm open I'm, i'm friendly with anybody um and yeah listen i think your audience should just if anything if any advice is there it's just like don't set high goals don't set yourself to failure from the beginning just take it one step at a, at, a, at a time and if you take it one step step at a time then you can reach where you want to reach faster than you imagined if you work a little bit and stop for longer and then start you know punishing yourself because ah, i did not do the work then you're not gonna go anywhere just take it easy yeah. on yourself life is too short we are not full-time athletes and uh, full-time athletes will not be listening to this because i am just another regular guy like anybody else who has a life has kids has a family has, has a wife has you know a business and we, we try to do the best we can just to enjoy this life That is beautifully said, and you know, thank you so much for doing this session. Really, really appreciate it. And as I mentioned, you know, you're one of the reasons why we actually went ahead and started this podcast as well. And you're on the top tier list of athletes. And based on the interaction, you know, with what we are having, I definitely put the title from grit to greatness. And I definitely hope you know you smash the High Rocks event in May and also the event tomorrow as well. So thank you so very much, brother, for doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a nice one. Have a nice one. Cheers.